These are German bombers in a movie about some British kids escaping the war into a mythical realm. Do we really need Sky Captain in the world of yesterday footage of these bombers? Maybe this is why the movie is 2 hours 23 minutes long. This intense opening is meant to give us context, but it also builds a connection to their home and their mother that the movie will never revisit or resolve for its entire two and a half hours. <laughs> Why can't you go out anyone but yourself? You're so selfish! You could have got us killed! You know what else could get you killed, Peter? Leaving that bunker door open just so you can chastise your little brother. Shut the door! When boarding a train, please make sure to inform us if you are starring in a film, so you can be seated by a window on the station side for maximum waving effect. Thank you and enjoy your evacuation. You will listen to your brother, won't you, Edmund? <laughs> be a big girl. Okay, I will, but, um... Do you mean emotionally, like Dakota Fanning and Man on Fire? Or do you mean physically, like 80s Monica on Friends? Or do you mean spiritually, like that whale rider chick? Movie isn't the screw tape letters. Mrs. McCready? I'm afraid so. Movie spends so much time Oliver Twisting and Anne of Green Gabling, I'm beginning to wonder if it's ever going to go Narnia chronically. And above all, there shall be no disturbing of the professor. Oh, now I understand this too long setup. They're hoping to create a Narnia-verse, which I guess they kind of do for another movie or two. I don't know. I forget how it all worked out. Well, is it Latin? Yes. Is it Latin for worst game ever invented? Edmund is such a miserable, whiny little bastard, always correcting everyone and pointing out the mistakes and... Hey! Random and convenient, completely empty chest is both random and convenient. She ran through at least two hallways and is at the far end of this room with the door closed. I doubt she's hearing Peter at all. Lucy accidentally herself into Narnia. Is wandering into a fantasy world a common occurrence for Lucy? She doesn't seem shocked or scared at all that this closet led to some sort of winter wonderland. How is she at least not running back the way she came at this point to inspect what happened? And without proper orienteering skills and basic intelligence, Lucy died of hypothermia long before the game of hide and seek was over. Lucy's left hand touches the pole, but an immediate cutaway shows it's her right hand, and then immediately her left again. I haven't seen pole work that fast since, well, Never mind. <laughs> yes, Lucy, be very afraid. I've seen what James McAvoy does when he's in beast mode, and you don't want any part of it. Did this movie even have a continuity department? The fingerprints are different in almost every shot, the packages are in different places than they land, and if we track every continuity error through this whole thing, we'll be here longer than a Narnian winter. Let's just add 15 sins and call it a day. And from our fawn fashion line, we call this the topless scarf look, for when you have to keep your neck warm and your nipples hard at the same time. And actually, I'm tallest in my class. And also most annoying. From from the lamppost, all the way to Castle Care Paravel on the Eastern Ocean. Every stick and stone you see is Narnia. Fawn splaining. It's an awfully big wardrobe. Why would she think she's still in the wardrobe? Confusion about where she is exactly, sure, but she does know the difference between indoors and outdoors, right? How would it be if you came and had tea with me? Well, it would be sort of like a kidnapping and an Amber Alert would be issued. Lucy accepts the half-naked stranger's invite to tea, further ignoring her siblings and how many rules of hide-and-seek she's breaking. This entire movie's events could be avoided if Lucy would just act her age and get scared of the snowscape and goat stranger and run back through the wardrobe into the mansion. If you have sardines... <laughs> By the bucket load. In the dead of winter? Are they frozen bucket loads? I read these books as a kid and loved them. I saw this movie as an adult and thought it was fine. I'm watching this movie now as a sinner, and God almighty, it's downright insufferable. You all right? Other than the frostbite, you mean? <laughs> yeah, I'm awesome. Matt Lowering. What the f It's like, hey, come to my house for tea, then psychedelic fluting. Why would whatever magic powers this f***ing thing has not let the siblings get to Narnia now if it's just gonna let them do it the next time? God, even the wardrobe itself is involved in the scheme to pad the runtime. If she knows she's going back to Narnia, wouldn't she do more to prepare than just slide some boots on? Maybe a jacket? A hat? Some fawn repellent? So Lucy comes through to Narnia and immediately meets good guy Tumnus Bombadil. Edmund comes through to Narnia in the same spot, mind you, and immediately meets bad guy Ice Queen. Is Narnia super f***ing tiny or just super f***ing convenient? Anything you'd like to eat? Turkish delight? Sheesh. First, Tumnus traps Lucy in and Fire Flute roofies her. Now, a discount collateral here is basically running a Hey Kid Wants Some Candy on Edmund. I'm not sure who the Narnian version of Chris Hansen is, but they suck at their job. Grumpy Dwarf is a dick to magic chalices. We must assume she's telling the truth. Old, goofy, and confusing guy who likes to smoke a pipe gives the small heroes advice while seemingly just babbling about gibberish. Again, I'm not sure who got there first, but it's clear as day Lewis and Tolkien were writing their famous fantasies at the exact same time. Poised to take yet another wicket. Cricket. That, my. When did Lucy even have time to make that snowball? Her hands are empty here, and Peter has been looking at her the whole time. Snowball fight? Really? It's your first time in a magical land fully contained inside a wardrobe. Not your first time seeing snow, you f***ing dolts. 30 seconds of filmmaking tricks designed to make viewers scared and nervous, only to introduce a goddamn beaver, who is a good guy, that will go on to help them. This is the movie's version of a time-wasting jump scare. Yeah, boy. 
I ain't gonna smell it. English-speaking upright walking beaver behaves completely like an actual beaver for no apparent reason, especially considering beavers likely never met an actual beaver to know how to beaver in the first beaver. Beaver. He's a beaver. He shouldn't be saying anything. Susan would be excellent at anthropomorphisms. That's an awful lot of open flame for a structure made entirely of wood. I'm just saying, don't borrow a faulty crock pot from the neighbors. That's all. Fish and chips. <laughs> Hmm, large dam, element of danger, talking beavers, sardines. This movie has most of my sexual fantasies all rolled into one scene. Who's Aslan? Who's Aslan? <laughs> you cheeky little blighter. Why would Beaver think that they knew this and were joking? He knows they're not from here, right? They don't even know about the prophecy. Prophecies. You know, that doesn't really rhyme. Poem Nazi. It's time the four of us were getting home. Ed? That damn room is in no damn way big enough for Edmund to have made his damn escape without being seen. These doors seem a bit impractical. Edmund is a punk-ass little bitch. Already ditched his family at a race to the obviously evil queen because she has some candy. Walks through a field of statues that, to me, the casual observer, are clearly Medusa-style frozen real creatures, and draws glasses and a mustache on one. Edmund. This movie should have been called Chronicles of Narnia, Edmund is a Ponce. Also, movie has time for this. My apologies, fortunate favorite of the queen. Or else, not so fortunate. Jeez, Wolf, if you're gonna sinisterly foreshadow the queen's evil intentions, at least wait until you're out of Edmund's earshot to do so. This way, for your num nums. Honestly, I wrote and erased several jokes about this line, but ultimately I can't shake the thought that this way for your num nums would make an excellent band name. <laughs> Man, how many movies is Liam Neeson in where a pack of wolves are the bad guys? <laughs> movie cheats like my college girlfriend here and it makes me furious because the kids and beaver are already gone when the wolves show up. But to keep the audience surprised, they edited the footage to make it look like the wolves had shown up before they got away. Basically, they edited this with the editorial hand of a Keeping Up With The Kardashian showrun. It's a good thing the beeves built this escape tunnel big enough for humans to run through. That's some pretty impressive foresight, I tells ya. This barrel is A, too small to cover the opening, B, too light to not easily be moved, and C, rollable. This in no way better is their predicament. Ah, the old hide high up in a tree and hope you can remain quiet routine. Never mind how the f they got up there so fast. They ran north. Smell them out. If you can smell them out, why do you need his help with the direction? And why can't you smell them since they're really close nearby? The time is short and Aslan himself has asked me to gather more troops. Fox News. Ah, I see they shot this scene on Green Screen Mountain. Now Aslan's camp is near the stone table just across the frozen river. Awesome. How the f*** do you know that? Your own wife was shocked a few minutes ago to meet a fox that had met Aslan. Yet you know the exact route and location of the secret camp? Is this coincidence? Or just a beaver marriage so torn apart by lies and distrust that divorce is imminent? Long journey. Such arduousness. Soul fellowship. Here's a jump scare chase scene that has all the tension of a genuinely scary moment. Except that it ends with Santa Claus. Yep, Santa Claus. Has a movie ever jumped the shark at its own halfway point? I've put up with it a lot since I got here. Thing I said while watching the film somehow went back in time and became a line in the script. Santa gives each human child a special gift, a la The Wizard of Oz. And I'm suddenly starting to wonder if C.S. Lewis was just really good at paying close attention to other works of fiction that captured the public's imagination. Also, it would have been hilarious if he gave three of them cool swords and helmets and but then gave the last one a lame gift like, Aw oh man, socks! Trust in this bow and it will not easily miss. Did the prophecy about the humans on the throne say anything about all the mythical and magical help they would receive on their way there? What is happening right now? A frozen river wild. Lucy and the gang pass flowering trees in the dead of snowy winter, leading me to believe they inadvertently entered the shimmer. Witch slap. Why are they all staring at us? Have you absorbed nothing about the prophecy of Adam's descendants? You're supposed to be smart. Look, this is a massively super huge army gathered here, where Aslan apparently is. And yet the Ice Queen knew nothing of Aslan's return or his location until Edmund told her? God, she has the worst informants. This unexplained centaur makes a lot more sense than the one in Bright. Welcome, Peter. Son of Adam. Even in 2005, Liam Neeson as Aslan was a bit of casting that was too on the nose. The evil Gimli torments Edmund for fun. My question is, why did they keep him alive? And even if keeping him alive has a good excuse, why did they bring him along into battle? Please don't try to run. We're tired, and we prefer to kill you quickly. Do you, though? Because it seems to me Discount Gmork and the pack had the upper hand until you blew it all with a cheap jump scare growl instead of a surprise attack. Susan! There is no way Susan covered that amount of ground that quickly and got a blow on that horn before being turned into a wolf chow. Is it just me, or does Peter have a bad case of the wobbly sword? Peter and the wolf. Peter, clean your sword. Well, actually, Mr. Aslan, this is a Disney film, so mm, there's not really anything to clean off of it. The prisoner. So before the Ice Queen even knew what was happening, this small band of heroes wiped out her entire camp, grabbed Edmund, and still had time to tie up Grumpy? Man, they were in and out faster than Chinese food. Narnia's not going to run out of toast, Ed. Okay, but where does Narnian toast come from? Where does the flour come from? 
Why is the bread so evenly cut? Do you toast it on a campfire? It's not like Aslan can buy the bread down at the local food line. The older sibling takes one turn practicing archery, and because it was Santa that gave her this gear, she ends up being awesome at it and doesn't even need the practice. Hey, horsey! <laughs> My name is Philip. If the sequel to this film had been about the life and times of Philip the Horsey, they'd still be making Narnia movies today. So, did they do it? Everyone got up and reacted before she even disturbed the curtain and walked out. How do I know your promise will be kept? Apparently this roar is Magic Jesus lying for bitch please. The Passion of the Lion. This movie dwells and lingers on the Jesus character's death even more than the Bible does. Jesus, I mean, sorry. Holy Christ, I mean, wow. Tonight, the deep magic will be appeased. Oh, sure, it sounds all cool when Tilda says it, but when I say it, all I get is an eye roll from my wife. It's too late, he's gone. How does Susan know this? I mean, did she take some sort of lion life science class back at Finchley High? She didn't even take his pulse. Why is this even allowed? Why did the Ice Queen kill Aslan but tell her entire army to peace out and leave that lion body here for others to mourn him or for him to come back to life, which he's obviously going to do? We have to tell the others. We can't just leave him. Lucy, there's no time. Susie Smarty Pants actually has a good point here. They just heard the White Witch say she's coming to kill them all. So maybe cut the beast or mourning short a bit and go give your buddies a heads up. Trees. Tree mail. Be still, my princes. I bring grave news from your sisters. Literally. There's an army out there. And it's ready to follow you. I can't. Aslan believed you could. And so do I. The f***? You were literally betraying him up until a few minutes ago. For reasons I hope are well established at this point, I believe this giant eagle can just go f*** itself right in the ear. Thank God they escaped the dangers of World War II. I'm sure these three are supposed to be giants, but am I alone in thinking this looks more like three regular blokes? And a bad case of Honey, I Shrunk the Mythical Horde? This Battle of Helm Shallow will contain lots of clanking metal and not a single drop of blood. At least four straight minutes of battle sh I've seen done better by more than one film or franchise. The point is that this film's biggest sin is repetitive blandness. I mean, who is actually surprised by this? Way too much time spent with Aslan explaining the table, the markings, and does anyone else remember there's a battle going on right now? Generic, we'd have would have done it better battle footage. Once Aslan is alive, this movie becomes predictable as hell. Good to see Wakanda sent some help. Sure, it looks like this sword goes through the arm here, but in the follow-up shots, the sword clearly missed his arm completely for Pete's sake. I mean, literally. It is finished. And by finished, I mean still 20 minutes left in this movie, two more movie sequels, and four other books that still haven't been made into movies, but, you know, semantics. I give you Queen Lucy. Skip! Not only did this joke conclusion from earlier seem out of place and takes way too long to pay off, there is no way the charcoal would have stayed on that lion this long. Long live the king. Albus Severus Potter. You were named after two headmasters of Hogwarts. And as such, there are a few rules we need to follow. There will be no shouting or running. Too many article without a voucher, and they dock you! I am a hat. You are a shoe. The juice of the fireflower. <laughs> I'm gonna start beating the shit out of you in the next five seconds, and you're gonna swallow a lot of blood for a Billfold. Lucy, where are you? Lucy, you got so splaining, you. It's a beaver. Thank you. I just had it stuffed. Let it go, let it go. Look, just because some man in a red coat hands you a sword, it doesn't make you a hero. You can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tart threw a sword at you. Don't waste my time with flattery. This is going to be a total cluster cuss. 